Amen. Praise forever to the King of Kings because he lived for us, he died for us, he was buried for us, he was raised for us, and he was ascended for us. But I also want you to understand biblically that when you were converted, you died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. You were raised with Christ. Not metaphorically, not symbolically, but really and truly. And because of that, we are new creations, and we can say yes to righteousness and no to sin. Turning your Bibles to Colossians 3. We're continuing our study of what is one of my favorite letters of Paul. It's all about the Christ-centered life. And it's about the Christ-centered life because there were false teachers in Colossae that tried to teach the young Christians that Jesus got them started. But if they really wanted to experience a a life-changing walk with God then they needed to add some other things to their lives besides Christ. They needed to add some Jewish traditions. They needed to add some self-help philosophies from some pagan or secular uh, ideas and philosophy. And Paul writes the Colossians to also remind us by God's Spirit that Jesus is all we ever need. That you never move beyond Jesus in the Christian life. You simply continue to move more deeply into your union with Christ. Our specific focus this morning is the Christ-centered life by putting sin to death. It is the battle of our lives. It is a relentless battle that will last until the day we die or Christ comes to take us home. A man named Jay Rathman, a deer hunter, was hunting deer in Northern California. He had to climb over a ledge, and as he got to the top of the ledge, he sensed movement to the right of his face, and suddenly... Like lightning, a coiled rattler struck at him. He moved his face at the last minute, and the snake's fangs missed the snake's fangs missed his face and got gnarled up in a turtleneck sweater that Rathman was wearing. The force of the strike caused the fangs to be on the right side and his body to be over top of Rathman's left shoulder. He took his left hand and grabbed the neck of the rattlesnake. He could feel the warm venom running down his chest. (laughs) For those of you who are new, I hate snakes. I can barely tell this story. Well, to make things even dicier, he slips during all of this, and he goes sliding head forward through brush and trees and lava rocks and he ends up being wedged his feet being wedged above his head and the blood rushing to his head and now he's starting to feel like he's going to pass out he is desperate he's still got the snake by his left hand somehow he manages with his right hand to get his rifle that had also fallen down uh, the rocks and was able to pry the snake's fangs from his sweater. But then the snake had enough leverage to strike his cheek just below with his nose, and and thankfully the snake didn't get enough leverage to open his mouth. They were looking eyeball to eyeball. Finally, Rathman just squeezed with all his might, and he finally choked the snake to death. Rathman estimated it took about 20 minutes for this entire event to be completed. And when he tried to throw the snake from him, he couldn't. He had to literally pry 
his fingers from the snake because he'd been grabbing on so tightly. How's that for a battle? We battle a serpent as well. The serpent of old. The devil. And the fight doesn't last 20 minutes. And though he may not have literal fangs, he is filled with venom. And he is seeking to pull us back into a sin that we have been released from. Jesus was promised as Messiah who would crush the serpent's head. That has happened. The serpent has been mortally wounded and defeated. And yet we are still called to our responsibility to put sin to death. And Paul talks about that this morning. So let's all stand out of reverence for God's word. And again, you know, there's so many traditions in churches. I hope we never get tired of this tradition. Standing out of reverence for the reading of the word. May it always remind us that this is God's word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. This is God's word. He gave it to us because he loves us. He wants us to understand the full implication of our union with Christ, and he wants us to put sin to death. Let's pray. Father, as we sort of take a deep dive, because Paul does, enable us to hang with the text. And Holy Spirit, please open our minds, soften our hearts, move our wills. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So this morning, we're going to look at three truths that we must embrace that will enable us to put sin to death. First of all, put sin to death by embracing a new reality. Now, this is going to stretch you because it stretches me. The, the basic premise that Paul is making here is that you remember you were born once from your mother's womb. You were born physically. And then, therefore, you were born into this world in time and in space. Got that, right? Paul is saying when we were born again, that is when God granted us by his grace repentance and faith, we were made aware of our sin we recognized we could not work to pay our sin off. We recognized that Jesus Christ was, was God's only provision to take care of our sin. We were given the faith to transfer our trust from ourselves to Jesus alone in his finished work. We were then born again. Now, when we're born again, the introduction into a new reality is just as real 
as the reality that we were born into when we were born physically out of our mother's wombs. When Paul says we have died with Christ and we've been raised with Christ, he is not using metaphor. He is not using symbolism. He is not merely talking positionally. He is saying really and truly God has accomplished something supernatural in you. That when you were baptized into Christ, and again, that's conversion, baptized into Christ, of which water baptism is simply an outward sign. When you were baptized into Christ spiritually, which Paul says in Colossians 2, also means being circumcised spiritually, which is why at Oak Mountain and Presbyterian churches, we baptize infants because eight-day-old male infants were circumcised, and therefore we believe the children of believers today should be circumcised. But the point was, that was an outward sign of God baptizing us into Christ, into his, into his death and resurrection, so that really and truly who we were when we were born physically in Adam, under Adam's sin, in Adam's guilt and condemnation, but also under sin's rule. That nature, that old person that we were, spiritually died. And we are no longer slaves to sin. That's not, the, not something you just need to think, okay, I'm going to think positively. It's the, pos, it's the power of positive thinking. No, it actually happened. You're a different person person than everybody else in the world that doesn't know Christ. It's a new reality. We think of dimensions, length, width, height. Height. I always say height. Height. Okay? Here's another dimension. The spiritual dimension. And in that spiritual dimension, you are a new creation. It's so important that we grasp this and embrace it. The Christian life is not simply choosing new priorities and a new philosophy and a new moralism. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is you are a new creation through the supernatural work of God by his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says in verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ. He's not casting doubt. He's saying since you've been raised with Christ. Look at verse 3. For you have died. That, that, that's not hyperbole. It really happened. Now you didn't feel like you died. You may not have had existential experiences that you died, but in a very real sense, you died with Christ on the cross. Don't ask me how. It's part of the mystery of the gospel. But an existential change occurred in your life that is real. So again, it's not, hey, have a new perspective. You're a Christian now. So change your behaviors and start following Christ. No. It's, hey, you have been supernaturally brought into a new reality, a new dimension where you truly are no longer a slave to sin. You have been delivered, not just from sin's penalty, but from sin's power. And one day, because again, putting sin to death is a battle, we'll be free from sin's, sin's presence, also because of the work of God. You know, in, uh, in Exodus, where Israel is enslaved to Egypt, they're in bondage, and God really and truly delivers them into a new physical reality. They are brought out of bondage through the Red Sea, God, God's miraculous power, and eventually they're brought into the promised land. Well, if you can grasp that in time and space, 
what Paul is saying is what's happened to you when you were converted is just as real. God has taken you out of Egypt. Now it is metaphorical for our sakes. Out of your metaphorical Egypt, which is slavery to sin. But the deliverance is just as real. You're in a new reality now. You're no longer slave to sin. You're no longer dead in Adam. You're no longer under condemnation. You have been delivered over to a new dimension. Verse 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, you will appear with him in glory. So, we are genuinely new. A, new, a genuinely new reality, but we're not yet completely new. God is allowed to remain within us who are delivered from the power and rule of sin. He has allowed the influence of sin to remain in us that we must put to death. So we've died to sin, really and truly, and therefore we can put sin to death. Again, verse 9, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. You get the idea that Paul is saying this over and over and over again in this short passage, pounding it into our heads, saying, I know y'all aren't going to get this because it's so beyond anything we ever normally talk about. Because so many Christians think the Christian life, becoming a Christian, is just turning over a new leaf. It's, it's, it's just trying to turn your life around. No. It is a brand new existence. When Paul says you are a new creation through faith in Christ, he's not speaking hyperbole. You, in fact, are a new creation through faith in Christ. And verse 10, you've put on the new self, which is being renewed after the image of its creator. So again, we're genuinely new, we're brand new, but we're not completely new. And we need to fight the good fight of faith. We need to fight to put sin to death. But we do it out of the new reality that is true of our lives. Now, just reflect on this. How much confidence does that give you in life, in marriage? in parenting, in singleness, in vocation, in temptation. You are a new creature. You're not a slave to sin. You can say no to sin. You can say yes to righteousness because it's what God has done in you. We've all heard of St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a town in Florida. Augustine is the dude from the 4th century A.D. Okay, Augustine was prayed for by his mom for many, many years because Augustine was a royal terror growing up. But his mom continued to pray for him, and sure enough, her prayers were answered, and Augustine came to Christ. He had lived a wild life, uh, very immoral. He was in Rome after his conversion. Uh, he was taking care of some business there in Rome. And a woman with whom he'd had an inappropriate relationship saw him and cried out, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. And Augustine, remembering that he, in fact, had died in Christ, had been raised to a new life, not, hyper, not hyperbole, but in true spiritual reality, said, Ah, but it is not I. It is not I. If you're a Christian, you've been delivered to a new reality. So put sin to death by embracing a new reality. Secondly, put sin to death by embracing a new responsibility. Okay, in the New Testament, gospel privileges always are the springboard of gospel responsibilities. And they're never switched around. In other words, gospel responsibilities are never the means to gospel privileges. Never. But gospel privileges are always the springboard to gospel responsibilities. So when Paul says we've been delivered to a new reality, we are part of a new dimension, that's the gospel privilege. 
out of that new reality, now we are called to live because we are new creations. So look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore. What's the therefore? Therefore. Because Paul has just said, you have died with Christ, you've been raised with Christ, you're a new creation, you're part of a new dimension, a new reality, so now live according to who you are. Not like try to pretend that you're somebody different and be a better person. No, you are, in fact, a new creation. So now, just live in light of that. And choose to put sin to death. If you're raised with Christ, verse 1, gospel privilege, seek the things that are above, gospel responsibility. You've been raised with Christ, verse 1, set your mind on the things that are above, gospel responsibility. Now, when it talks about above and below, we're not talking spatially here. It's not like heaven's really up there and hell's really down there. It's talking about the things of this world the physical birth into sin, this broken world, and the new dimension, the kingdom, the new reality, the power of the new Jerusalem and the kingdom of God breaking in upon this world in our lives. So it doesn't mean some ethereal heavenly mindedness that has no reality or relationship to this world. It means live out your life in the kingdom here and now. You are actually a citizen of the New Jerusalem, and you've been left here to live out life in the New Jerusalem on this planet until God brings the New Jerusalem, I believe, to this planet. So verse 5, put to death whatever is earthly. Now, what this means is putting sin to death is not automatic. Even though we have been changed existentially, even though we are new creations, we don't just get zapped into an obedient life. It actually requires us to engage the renewed will that is ours in Christ. So Paul says in Romans 8, for example, Romans 8, 13, you by the Spirit, no one else, you by the Spirit, you as a new creator, creation, by the Spirit, still trusting in the power of grace, you put to death the deeds of the body. You ever wonder what Paul means in Philippians 2, 12 and 13? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling or awe and reverence because it's God who's at work in you. That's what it's talking about. You have been saved. You have been changed. You're a new creation. Now just work that out. Not work it out like you're saved by works or you are maintain God's delight in you and his blessing on you because you work. But be who you are. You're a new creation. You're no longer slaves to sin. So simply choose to be who you are. Now, specifically, he talks about certain sins that were cultural in that day and it's very relevant because they're just as cultural in our day. And Paul talks specifically about putting off sexual sins. We are sexual beings. God created us as sexual beings. We are male and female. But because we're sexual beings, that's where the enemy seeks to get us to fall off the wagon. And act as if we're not new creations. And act as if we actually still are part of this world system when in fact we aren't. So Paul says we're to put to death sexual immorality. That means any kind of sex outside of marriage. And by the way, singles, young people, it's not just talking about intercourse. Any kind of sex outside of marriage is immorality. And we have been dead to that because of the work of Christ, and we are therefore to not engage in it. We're to put it off. Premarital sex, extramarital sex, adultery. And then it comes to, porno to impurity. That would involve pornography. Okay? We are not to engage in that. 
And yet it's rampant in our day. It's impurity. It's not living as part of the realm that we're actually a part of. Sexting, clearly. Uh, Sexual flirtation. You know, all of those conversations, those are ungodly. Passions. Talking about evil, distorted passions. Uh, Notice that I've dealt with all kinds of other sexual issues. So now I'm going to actually address practicing homosexuality. Notice that I have not elevated it to a worse sin than all the others. It's part of us talking. You know, it's Pride Month this month. Well, people who struggle with same-sex attraction, we're not to be proud of it. Same way I'm not proud that I'm a worried person. I'm not proud that I'm a fearful person. I want to repent of my fear and worry all the time. And so people who are same-sex attracted, they're not second-class citizens, and they're able to be Christians, but they're to practice purity. They're to practice celibacy. But practicing homosexuality is clearly wrong, just like adultery is wrong. See, there's, there's no hate speech here unless you think I'm hating adulterers too, or hating gluttons and hating worry warts and... I mean, where do you draw the line? Uh, evil desires, that's, that's lusts, a lust of the flesh, uh, whether it be for, again, someone of a different gender or someone from your own gender. It's lust, it's evil, no matter how the lust is bubbling up inside of us. I would say that, that transgenderism fits here. Transgender or gender confusion, it's, it's just part of the brokenness of this life. Someone can have gender confusion and still live a pure life. But the Bible says we're not supposed to be proud of it. We're supposed to constantly grieve it and repent of it. Some people God will completely change. Some people He won't. They're going to have to fight the fangs of the snake till the day they die. Just like you and I have areas of our lives that we need to fight against the fangs. I'm still struggling with so much of the same insecurities that I had before I was a Christian. I hate that. Sometimes I feel I don't deserve to be up here. But then I realize we're all broken. The question is, Are we embracing the new responsibility because of our new reality to put sin to death? Covetousness, always wanting more, more sex, more money, more pleasure, more power, more control. That also is something that we're to put off. I've told you before about the story uh, in The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis of the guy that had a red lizard on his shoulder. It, it's almost like it goes back to the TV cartoons with an angel and a devil. Well, this guy had a red lizard. And this lizard would always speak taunting temptations into this guy's ear. And he was just tired of it. And God sent an angel to say, hey, I hear you want me to take care of this red lizard. And uh, the guy said, yeah, I sure do. It just bothered me all the time. And the angel said, well, stand back. I'm going to strike it down. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you were just going to like disable it for a little while. I'm not sure I want you to kill it. You see, the angel began to realize this guy was wrestling with some half-heartedness because deep down he knew that sometimes he actually liked to indulge what the red lizard was whispering into his ear. And he was afraid of what life might be like if the lizard was truly taken away from his life. See, one of the reasons why some of us struggle to put sin to death and to embrace that responsibility is because we really don't believe God's good. We really don't believe that God's command is an invitation to our highest pleasure. And we really don't believe that God's prohibitions are a warning against our worst nightmare. Because if we did, we wouldn't fear God killing the lizard. Now again, getting back to the first point, the new reality is God has killed the lizard. It's mortally wounded. 
It's going to die. It's just sort of kicking. And as it's screaming, it's still trying to whisper temptation into our mind. And we need to put the lizard to death. And then thirdly and finally, put sin to death by embracing a new reality. And thirdly, a new humanity. As I'm sorry, embrace a new responsibility and embrace a new humanity. Uh, it's interesting that Paul, on the one hand, calls us to responsibly embrace a new responsibility that really revolves around sexual purity. And man, is that timely for us in our day. But you know what else is timely? The new humanity is Paul calling us to recognize that because we have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, because we're in a new reality, and that new reality is the mysterious and mystical church where all Christians of all ages are mysteriously and mystically united with each other, that we are therefore in working out putting sin to death, we're to put to death all kinds of relational sins that tend to man that manifest themselves among Christians. Marriage, parenting, in the church, business dealings among Christians. And Paul says, once you were living in all these things that bring about God's wrath, now you're free from God's wrath. We've been transferred from the domain of darkness and wrath to the kingdom of the Son God loves. Once we were corporately united to the world in Adam, Adam's our federal head, and we were united with each other in sin, in guilt, in condemnation, and powerlessness. But now we're new creations, and we're now all part of a new fellowship, a new humanity. And because we're part of a new humanity, Paul says in verse 8, Therefore, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And let me tell you something. I have seen over the past 15 months much more of these sins in the church than I've seen of the previous list I just covered regarding sexual immorality. I have never seen Christians treat each other with such lack of respect and lack of dignity than I have over the past 15 months. God says, put to death anger. By the way, I know we all feel justified in our anger. Do you realize you're going to be hard-pressed to find one place in the entire New Testament where the Scriptures ever talk about the anger of man as being proper. In almost every single mention of anger of any kind, it's negative. In James, it says, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Wrath, that's talking about outbursts of temper, uncontrollable rage, Malice, designing to do harm to others, their reputation, their joy, their peace, malice. Slander, defaming somebody's character, gossip. It's amazing how much of this I've seen in the church. Mercy and justice. You realize that's biblical. Yet you talk about mercy and justice today and Christians start calling you a socialist. Folks, that's slander. And God says it's as serious as any of the sexual sins we covered. You talk about racial reconciliation. Well, now all of a sudden you believe in critical race theory. That's ridiculous. I don't know anybody in the PCA that believes in critical race theory. I don't know anybody in the PCA that's a socialist. And yet, you've got all these people, yan yan, about things falling apart in God's church. It's slander. If you've got an issue with somebody, by the way, I'm hardly even preaching to this church. I'm wanting to make sure you understand what's happening out there. 
But if I am preaching to you, then please receive it. You know, I could go on and on. <laughs> the, the latest thing is, if you're, if, you're, if you're into the Enneagram, you've obviously become satanic. You're part of the, the occult. It's like, I feel like the church has gone nutso in the past 15 months. Here's the other one. If you believe that someone can wrestle with gender identity and same-sex attraction then you are clearly going liberal because you are pro-homosexual. That's crazy. I don't know one single person in our denomination that would even be infinitely touching the, 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 the far edges of ever condoning practicing homosexuality. And yet, you've got people all over the place that are slandering good people and good institutions. And it's got to stop. And it's every bit as ungodly as sleeping with a prostitute. And Paul concludes by saying, here in this realm, in this reality, in this new humanity, there's no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. By the way, a barbarian was someone who couldn't speak Greek. So they, you know, they, they made fun of them like ba 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 ba. Like that's how they were talking. That's where the word barbarian comes from. Bar 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 bar. The Scythian was a barbarian that was up near the Black Sea, and they were completely uncouth and uncivilized, and so they were looked down upon. And I fear that I see in our church today, not our church, the church. I see an elitism. You know, we talk about the world and cancer cult, can cancel culture, which I am, of course, as tired of as you are. Guess what? I'm more concerned about the cancel culture I see in the church. Remember the, remember the story in Judges 12 about uh, shibboleths? If you don't remember the story, there were, there were these Israelites called Gileadites, and uh, they were fighting this group called the Ammonites. You know, everybody's a knight back in the Old Testament. And the Gileadites were fighting the Ammonites, and the Ephraimites were also part of the Old Testament church. And the Ephraimites were upset with the Gileadites because they didn't call the Ephraimites to help the Gileadites against the, Ephra uh, against the Ammonites. You got that? Okay, so there was... The, okay, let's put it this way. They're like two brothers, and then there's a bully. And the one brother didn't call the other brother to help him against the bully, but the one brother just took care of the bully himself. So the other brother gets all mad at this brother. So now you got the two brothers mad at each other. So now the Ephraimites, who were the ones that were mad at the Gileadites for not calling them to help, they're trying to cross the bridge to go back into Ephraim. But now the Gileadites are upset with their brother because they were upset first with them. There's a feud. And so what they said was, whenever one of our brothers, the Ephraimites, comes across the bridge, ask them to say the word shibboleth. Well, they couldn't say it because they had a certain accent problem. And all they could say was shibboleth. And when an Ephraimite was trying to say shibboleth and said shibboleth, his brothers killed him. They slaughtered tens of thousands of their brothers because they couldn't say shibboleth. And I fear the same thing is happening in the church today. And how are you guilty? How have you slandered, judged? And you never even talk to the person about what you think they mean. And God says, when we do things like that, we are destroying our witness. And the world is going to mock Jesus over it. As a matter of fact, our union with each other, because of our union with Christ, is such that whenever you slander a Christian, you're slandering Jesus himself. 
You don't believe me? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He said, why are you persecuting me? Saul was trying to persecute Christ and he didn't even know it. And when we slander or are malicious or are unkind toward brothers and sisters, we are being all those things to Jesus. And it's not who we are. If you know Christ, you're part of a new reality. You've been transformed from the from, transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of, of the son he loves. If you're a Christian, you have a, you have a new responsibility because you have a new ability. You have a new response ability. You're able to say yes to righteousness and no to sin. And you're part of a new humanity where Jesus said, everyone will know we're Christians by our love for one another. Let's pray. Father, uh, forgive us. Forgive us for not believing the gospel, for not truly believing that we're new creations. Forgive us for often living as if we're just like everybody else. We just happen to be committed to the priorities of a Bible. But God, that's not true. We are brand new creatures in Christ. God, forgive us for our sexual impurity. Forgive us for yelling at the world and engaging in the same things ourselves. Forgive us for being hypocrites. And Lord, forgive us for how we've treated our fellow brothers and sisters. How we've allowed fake news among Christians to lead to slander and division. God, grant us repentance. And may the world see that we really are different because of you and that they would long to know Christ because they see him in us. We pray all this for your glory, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's all stand and hear our benediction. The promise of God's grace and love upon us. Remember, we never move beyond Jesus. We just move more deeply into him. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Abba Father and the fellowship and transforming power of the Holy Spirit be with you now.